Yeah, it's a bit uh, an enigmatic title uh, to raise your interest, of course. Um, I think you know by now that I'm a bit obsessed with time and uh, the fact that we're running out of time. <laughs> And that's why I uh, deleted half of my slides just in the, in the pause, uh, just before. But now I don't know if there's any sensible story left, so we will have to see together whether or not this makes sense, what I'm telling. Um, I'm, I was really happy to hear about all these possible treatments uh, for, for CDG that are coming up and that are being tested, etc. Uh, but there is a, a downside, and that's what I want to tell you about. Not trying to uh, get you depressed, but uh, just that you have to bear in mind that uh, these new treatments, especially in rare diseases, they all come with a price. Of course, they have to get developed, and then they have to get to the market, and then they have to get reimbursed, etc. And that is actually a difficult story that is uh, nowadays starting to, to hamper uh, new development and new, new treatments. And that is a pity, of course, because everyone is doing their best to develop new drugs, uh, even to understand how diseases work, and then develop new drugs. And then you get to the point where you want to start giving these drugs to your patients. And then it turns out that you, you can't get there. And so uh, together with a few colleagues in Leuven from the pharmacoeconomics department, we have been doing a lot of research over the last years, uh, trying to understand how, uh, how this works, and maybe how we can overcome the fact that all this work sometimes ends in, in disappointment when uh, good drugs do not reach the market because they turn out to be too expensive. Uh, just to give you an example, a silly calculation, uh, we heard yesterday that there are 38 uh, patients with the NGLI-1. Uh, on average, developing a new drug and getting it to the market, doing the clinical trials, etc., would cost between 800 million and a billion dollars. Uh, if you divide this by 38 patients, that would mean that you need 25 million per patient to, uh, to uh, get your investment back. And then, as a firm, you're not even making any profit. So we have to start thinking about this in a different way. Um, and that's what we try to do. So these are my colleagues uh, on the left, colleagues from the Department of uh, Pharmacoeconomics, and then me on the right from the Metabolic Center. I think they just need someone with pragmatism to keep them in the right direction. But over the last years, we have done a lot of studies. And um, this is just to give you an idea about the European market. And uh, the US market is similar, I have to say. Uh, we had an, an orphan drug regulation from 2000 on. And you see that the orphan drug designations have been uh, increasing to a number of over 100 now. Orphan drugs that are approved, that are on the market, uh, but not necessarily reimbursed. Because no, uh, this is the example from, from Belgium. Um, if you look at the uh, beginning of last year, there were uh, almost 80 uh, drugs that were approved to, to be uh, sold. Of those, 53 were reimbursed, and then uh, they were not reimbursed for the whole indication, but there were further um, limitations to their use, age restrictions. Uh, there were um, further uh, requirements imposed on the firm to come back with new data. Uh, certain subtypes of diseases are excluded. There's a huge administrative hassle to get reimbursement, which is so uh, demotivating to doctors and patients that often uh, the drug isn't even uh, asked for or reimbursement isn't asked for. And this is contradictory to the, the basis of the orphan drug regulation, which is that society has a moral obligation to provide a minimum of health care to help the less fortunate and not to abandon those in need. This is uh, the fundamental rights. And this means that wh whether you have a, a frequent disease that has a cheap treatment, or whether you have a rare disease that has a, an expensive treatment, you all have the same right to treatment. So if you see that there are these treatments, but they just don't reach the patients, that is actually not what the uh, fundamental rights are uh, all about. And this is also contradictory with the fact that we are making huge advances. We have been seeing it here over the last two days, advances in knowledge, and there is lots of innovation. And a lot of this innovation is particularly in the field of orphan drugs. 
Uh, you have gene therapy. There is a first gene therapy approved uh, for marketing. Just recently, there is this enzyme replacement therapy that started in orphan uh, indications. Uh, you have the biologicals, cell therapy. These are all new means of treating patients that started off in the orphan diseases field. And then just to give you an example for Belgium specifically, half of the R&D investment in industry in Belgium originates from biopharmaceutical companies. So if we're not going to support development of drugs by not reimbursing these drugs, we're actually uh, killing our own economy. So that was the reason for us to go to uh, policymakers and say, look, you have to look at this differently because this is not serving our patients and this is not serving our economy. And what we uh, propose, it's a little bit silly, but what we propose is to take out the budget from health insurance and make an envelope, an envelope for uh, orphan drugs. So you, you isolate this budget from the rest of the drug budget because you're always going to compete with anti-hypertensive drugs or diabetes drugs, and that's a lot of patients, and those drugs are less expensive, but on the whole, these, uh, the budget for these, uh, for these patients is going to be a lot bigger, uh, but you will always end up having this discussion that if you treat one patient and it costs you 300,000 euros a year, with that budget, you could have helped a lot of patients with more common diseases, so you have to separate these budgets. And then, second point, you would have a guaranteed access for some of these drugs and you would make rational priorities which are uh, determined by experts in the field and not by administrators as it, as it is now very often. And then you would keep a small part of that envelope uh, where you would uh, do some random allocation, so a lottery almost, and you would put that budget uh, in, in a field, a disease field, where there is a need for a budget, but there isn't any budget left, yeah? And this is actually what our uh, ethics uh, specialists consider the, uh, the best possible option to be able to treat also patients with rare diseases with more expensive treatments. So you isolate the budget and you keep part of that budget and you allocate that randomly, yeah? So everyone has the same chance of getting treatment for their disease instead of always being put back because your treatment is expensive. So we call this FOSTER, a fund for orphan drugs towards an ethical reimbursement. And that would allow you to have all these drugs that went through the whole procedure of selection at the European Medicines Agency or the FDA. You would get uh, immediate reimbursement and that would allow drugs for unique... Well, we also want to take out the oncology drugs because that is really uh, scary how that market is booming and how these drugs are always for smaller indications. And um, I think the, mar uh, the, the health insurance cannot keep up with that. Yeah? But we are talking about orphan diseases, non-oncological orphan diseases, where you have uh, a budget that you can fix, and I will show you why. And these are diseases that often have no uh, alternatives for treatment. So what is this at estimated budget? We looked at all the studies in the EU that calculate this, uh, the, the expenditure, so the, the, um, the cost of, of orphan drugs uh, over, the, over the years. And um, as a percentage of the whole drug uh, expenses, you see that in the beginning there were no orphan drugs because the regulation was only from 2000, but now it's going to a plateau and it's between 4 and 5% of the whole drug budget, which is not too much, I would think. And if it's a plateau, then we can calculate and we can project how it's going to be in the future. And we calculated for Belgium, if it's 4 or 5%, that it would be maximum uh, 225 million euros per year which is not much, looking at the whole budget uh, that is for drugs, let alone the whole budget for healthcare. And that is actually all I have time for. <laughs> <laughs> so
so the actual message is that you, if you go to your policymakers, you don't have to present your uh, expensive orphan drug as something that will be uh, uh, detrimental for your health care. No, you have to present this as being some kind of a reinvestment in your own economy.